Excellent. Uh, good morning and welcome to all the panelists and participants. We know it's a difficult time for everyone in India and really appreciate your participation today. To those who are celebrating, allow me to wish you Eid Mubarak. The topic of today's webinar is the impacts of overfishing around the coast of India. And we have three eminent experts to inform and enlighten us on the state of Indian fisheries and the role of subsidies. Most of you know that many governments around the world provide subsidies to their country's fishing fleets. In India, these subsidies disproportionately support well-connected firms and large trawling boats, missing the small-scale fishers they were designed to help. The World Trade Organization is currently undergoing uh, treaty talks on the potential for subsidy reform. The head of the WTO, uh, who took over in March, Director General Nogozi Okonja Iwala, plans to host a ministerial meeting on July 15, where she hopes an agreement can be reached on cutting fishing subsidies after 20 years of talks. She has invited ministers of all countries to find a common resolve and spirit of compromise that the WTO needs to bring to these 20 years plus negotiations to a successful conclusion at this meeting. So there is hope that after 20 years, we see some movement, intensive negotiations are expected in Geneva, uh, and we will probably see fourth version of uh, the negotiations and the uh, thing uh, this week, hopefully. Anyway, uh, for everybody's information, uh, once again, um, uh, to amplify the issues around subsidies and overfishing, Environmental Journalism Network is, off, uh, uh, is offering grants to journalists to support the production of in-depth stories that will call attention to fishing, uh, fishery subsidies issues, both at a large scale and small scale. We will share details of this in the chat box uh, uh, as well. For your information, we had also, uh, we had organized a similar workshop in November, 2019 with the same eminent speakers that we have today who guided our previous recipients. And the journalists produced great stories on the issue, uh, which provides us with a new uh, and better understanding and insights on the problems faced by Indian fishermen. You can check those stories out on the EG, EGN website. And in fact, I'll request Arushi if she can share that link as well uh, uh, in the chat box. Before I introduce the speakers, uh, I would like to invite all of you to use the Q&A box and not the chat box to ask questions to the speakers. We have nearly 45 minutes of presentations today that will be followed by responses to your questions and any discussion that you would like to have. I also have an announcement. Uh, one of our speakers, Dr. Velvili of MSSRF has had to excuse herself from today's webinar as she is feeling unwell with mild COVID symptoms and we wish her quick recovery. Uh, before uh, I was, if one second, uh, before we start, I also, I would like to uh, invite participants to not only look at the Q and a box and the grant, but a question has just come to me, how can we report uh, in this uh, COVID time where half the country is under lockdown. We are encouraging journalists to uh, do data mining, use your phones and uh, uh, report these stories. Uh, of course, where possible. And if you can, uh, you're welcome to uh, visit uh, on location to report. More of that later. Uh, let me uh, start by introducing the speakers. The first speaker, Professor Ramchandra C. Bhatta, uh, he's a marine resource economist and a scientist, uh, former division chair of National Center for Sustainable Coastal Management in Chennai. He was also professor of fisheries economics with College of Fisheries in Mangalore. He has made significant contribution in the fields of marine resource economics, coastal policy issues, and marine biodiversity valuation in the last three decades. He worked as ICAR Emeritus Scientist of Economics during 2015-18, his research and consulting experience with various international and multi multinational organizations uh, has uh, resulted in a lot of 
initiatives and projects in India. Today, he will enlighten us with his favorite topic, sustainable development of marine economy in India. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Sunil Mohammed. Uh, he's the principal scientist and former head of Molluscan Fisheries and Mariculture Division at CMFRI, Central Marine Fish Research Institute in Kochi. He has interest in marine ecological modeling, particularly its application to fisheries management. He was a leader of a team of researchers from CMFRI working on uh, trophic modeling of Indian marine e ecosystems and has modeled the Arabian Sea ecosystem of Karnataka and Kerala state, the Northwest Coast ecosystem and Gulf of Mannar ecosystem. He's currently the chair of Sustainable Seafood Network of India. He has served in national, several national expert committees on marine fisheries management in the country. And finally, we have Dr. Rashid Samala from Canada. He's professor and Canada Research Chair of Interdisciplinary Oceans and Fisheries Economics, the University of British Columbia. He's a University Kulam Professor and Canada Research Chair in Interdisciplinary Ocean and Fisheries Economics at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries and School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, University of British Columbia. His research focuses on bioeconomics, marine ecosystem valuation, and the analysis of global issues such as fisheries subsidies, marine protected areas, illegal fishing, climate change, marine plastic pollution, and oil spills. Uh, these speakers uh, have a lot of experience and expertise, and we're looking forward to them uh, guiding us and informing us today. So without much ado, I will invite Professor, Professor Bhatta to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, uh, nice uh, introduction. Maybe I'm not, uh, I do not deserve so much, uh, but anyway, uh, let us uh, begin the uh, presentation. All right. You could see the screen. Hello? Could you screen? Not yet, sir. No, no. All right. Now I think you can see. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we can see it. So, as introduced by Shailendra, uh, my, the topic of my presentation would be uh, is, is the sustainable development of the marine economy in uh, India. Uh, I will be talking more on this, uh, uh, the sustainable development goals and also how subsid marine fisheries subsidies in India are contradictory to the accepted sustainable uh, development uh, goals. Uh, so the marine fisheries is one of the richest resources, whichever the article you go through in uh, related with uh, the tropical countries, everybody talks about the rich marine resources of uh, the tropical countries, including uh, India. India is the world's second biggest producer of fish, 11 million tons. And also it is the second most populous country in the world in the sense, the per capita consumption would be much lower than that of the compare, compared with other uh, uh, developed countries. When it comes to the marine fish landings, it was around 3.56 uh, million metric tons with an estimated gross value of uh, 60,881 crores. <clears throat> and also this is the landing center value. And again, this is from the CMFRI and the retail value of uh, rupees 92,356 crores, that is in US $13.1 billion. The total extraction was double the reported marine fish production. Of course, uh, that is according to the University of uh, British Columbia, of course, uh, many of the scientists in India do not agree with this kind of an estimation, but that is what the, is uh, reported. And uh, the government of India plan, plan policy document, uh, especially the Matsya Sampada scheme talks about 9% increase in the fish production per year in the coming years. In spite of those high um, resources, the poverty level as estimated was quite high. The poverty increased from 61% to 67% from 2010 to 2016, as per the CMFRI uh, socioeconomic uh, census. The marine fishery census states that from 61% it has increased to 67%. During 2010-16, uh, 
of course the report was released only recently although it was the the the, the survey was conducted in 2015 16 compared to 30% for the national population the niti ayog reports that the national the, the national poverty level in india is around 30% but the marine fisheries uh, poverty level is uh, double the the national uh, uh, poverty level the per capita monthly average income of marine fisheries is around 67 uh, us dollars Uh, which is much lower than that of their counterpart in the agriculture sector the per capita annual fishing income in constant prices 2004 5 has stagnated around 4 lakhs during the 2005 and 16 so if you look at the uh, the per capita annual income the annual income has not increased from 2005 to 2016 the total fishing population represent around 2% of the total national population 2000 is 2016 with only 13% of the marine fishers even in this 2% only 30% are uh, marine fishermen the poverty and unsustainable investment in marine fisheries resources the estimated landing of low value bycatch in trawl fisheries increased from 14% in 2008 to 25% in 2011 and now it is around 35 to 40% that shows that more and more share of the marine resources are used for non directly non edible uh, purposes the landing center price of the low value bycatch is also showing an increasing trend in the in the sense the demand for the so called trash fish demand for low value bycatch has been increasing at a very faster rate and that means it is indicating the increasing demand for fish meal fish oil and surimi products declining trend in the edible portion of the trawl landings non edible catch consists of around 237 species again uh, this is reported by the cmfr publications of the marine fauna with juveniles of commercially important fishes the the next point that i would i will be touching is the share of fish exports in the production has increased in the 2004 only 15% of the value was exported in 2018 it has increased to 60% in terms of quantity in 2004 it was only 5% of the total marine fish production was exported now it has increased to 35% indicating the less availability of fish for domestic consumption components of sustainable or unsustainable investments i mean i'll be touching upon these uh, five points that is blue economy initiatives undermining the sustainable marine fisheries shifts in the utilization which i already uh, told you slides increasing marine so we lost you dr bhatta fish prices with the declining share of high value fishes yes hello yeah we lost you for a second there are uh, you back it's okay yeah. you have unsteady network uh now are you able oh sorry i mean uh, one minute yeah. maybe you can go back to the last slide sir now now are you able to hear yes clear yeah okay so the first point is the blue economy and blue growth initiatives adopted by the government of india when you talk about blue economy fisheries becomes only a one small component of the whole uh, uh, tourism transport renewable energy aquaculture seabed extractive activities marine biotechnology and bio prospecting in addition to of course non market based uh, carbon sequestration coastal protection waste disposal and biodiversity these are all the different components of the blue economy with the result fisheries becomes a shrinking sp space within the broader uh, blue economy growth So, so one one of the studies by the ncscm in 2014 of course it is a old data it, it talks about the fisheries i mean blue economy contribution is 1.5 trillion is the total contributions of the blue economy I, I mean, in in uh, rupees of course 1.5 trillion billion rupees but for the whole of uh, the blue economy initiatives in that the fisheries contribution as i mentioned is is only a few crores so that indicates that more and more importance policy importance and the 
the uh, planning importance is going to be given for the other sectors in the blue economy, which will undermine the importance of the fisheries and the livelihood opportunities. So, and the second one, second point is the shifts in the utilization. Fish meal and fish oil industry diverts around the 30%, which I already mentioned. The requirements of uh, surumi exports is there in the 11% and poultry feed would bring the total utilization of the marine fish for non-direct consumption to over 50%. These sectors support a multi-billion US dollars, 3.6 billion export market, as well as a large number of jobs in the FMFO chain from trawlers to shrimp exports. So the other thing is the increasing price, incre increasing income. Normally, this is the what uh, they, they, uh, they, they would say. Uh, so the marine fish wholesale price index of the marine, marine fish prices has been increasing um, during the last 2005 to 2016. And then, uh, uh, the, on the other hand, the oil sardine production, I mean, it is only a representative. Most of the high value fish species, including oil sardine production has been declining. This is the problem. So the increase in the price is not compensated. It has not resulted in increase in the income because of the large scale decline in the high value fish species and diversion of the fish from edible to non-edible purposes. So unsustainable, unsustainability with subsidies. Fuel subsidy, for example, uh, we have calculated that in Karnataka, around 288 crores, so there is around two, 22 billion, million in, our, in my state, that is 60% of the fisheries budget is being used for fuel subsidy alone. So where, is, where will be money for income support? Where will be the money for infrastructure? Where will be the money for, uh, I mean, out of the remaining 40%, around 30% is spent on salaries. And uh, so that is one problem that we are facing. And blue revolution schemes in the, by the government of India, central state, state, state and beneficiaries totally around 20,000 crores is going to be invested during 2025. Out of these 20,000 crores, how much is going to be the subsidy is not clear to me at this, at this stage. And then the third one is the third important um, receiver of uh, fishery subsidies in uh, port development, port infrastructure, research and development. Even fisheries institutes get a lot of subsidy from the government of India and the respective state governments. Income support is the last one, that is the relief payments and savings. Only in, in states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu, this relief payments and savings schemes have take a major uh, uh, part, but in, in most of the other uh, coastal states, this income support for, constitutes an insignificant uh, portion of the total subsidy. Improving fisheries management, marine ecological carrying capacity, assessment and reduction of vulnerability. No, I have not seen much subsidy going into this last uh, uh, sector, resulting in uh, less uh, knowledge about the carrying capacity of the marine uh, resources. And then uh, harmful subsidy, that is the trawl fisheries sector account for more than 60% of the marine uh, fish production. Out of 60% of the subsidized marine fish, around 40% is being utilized. I mean, this I have already mentioned. The point that I would like to uh, mention is the subsidizing the rich European consumers at the cost of domestic consumers, consuming low value marine and freshwater, which is marginally subsidized. So WTO talks about harmful subsidies to be prohibited. Inverse relationship between fuel and income support. I mentioned this, Karnataka spent 188 crores on fuel subsidy, but only 4.80 crores on income support. Whereas Kerala spent 41 crores on fuel and 128 crores on income support, which I mentioned you earlier. That means, that means more, more the money you spend on fuel subsidy, less money on poor income support. Fuel subsidies are aggressive. Commercial fishing vessels received 25% of their fuel cost as subsidy and only 14% in the case of small scale fishing. This is the one that Dr. Mr. Shailendra was pointing out. So how these fuel subsidy becomes regressive because more and more fuel consumption, more subsidy you get and 25% uh, in the case of commercial fishing vessels, whereas in the case of small scale OBM boats, 
it is only 14%. Fuel subsidy per ton was highest in Karnataka. It is around 3,600 rupees per ton compared to Kerala, which is the lowest, only 750 tons, 700 rupees, 750 rupees per ton in Kerala. Then uh, social inequity, which I was uh, inequity in returns, but is a average expenditure in a season for the purchase of diesel in rupees is 33,50,902 for the 130 HP engines and above, whereas it was 9,10,000 for the uh, for the um, boards with less than 70 HP which I mentioned that is 24% is given in the form of subsidy, whereas it is only 15% for less than 70 HP engines. So this is a, a point. Total fish harvest in kgs main value is 46,310 for the greater than 130 HP, and it is 9,836 kgs in the case of less than 70 HP. So proportion of uh, quite often the fisheries uh, scientists quite often they say that uh, the, the, there is no conflict between in resource uh, sharing of the resources between the small scale fishermen and the high, I mean, large scale fishermen, I mean, commercial fishermen. But as this particular uh, data shows, in the case of cuttlefish, 48 <coughs> boards have reported uh, cuttlefish, whereas only eight boards in the less than 70 HP boards have reported cuttlefish. Similarly, mackerel, I mean, I have listed a few souls wherein there is a very clear demarcation which shows that more the uh, number of boards reporting these uh, catches, there will be less number of catches, less, less number of boards reporting catches in the less than, less than 70 HP categories. So again, CMFRI talks about the, uh, the over exploitation of the fishery resources, percentage of fish stocks in Karnataka, it more than 30% uh, of the fish stocks in Karnataka is either declining or depleted or collapsed. So the abundant is only 12% in of the total. So in terms of uh, the migration of the uh, towards the coastal population, we have estimated based upon the, because the 2020 uh, national census data is still not available. From 1991, for example, in the three districts of uh, Karnataka, the population density within one kilometer from the high tide line has increased from 1,536 to almost uh, uh, 2,699, that is almost double, doubled. I mean, 2021 definitely could have doubled. So that is the representative, that is, that is what the more and more number of people are migrating towards the coast in spite of the CRZ, in spite of the several other regulatory measures. So this is the uh, dry fish that is being, uh, uh, yeah, Karnataka happens to be the center for um, high quantity, large quantities of dry fish production from Gujarat, Maharashtra, and many other states. Dry fish used to come to uh, Mangalore, and then from Mangalore, it gets uh, used to get distributed to uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu and other uh, places. So this is the status in uh, Karnataka. Uh, but then uh, less and less fish is now accessible to uh, dry fish women because of the huge competition from the fish meal and fish oil. Uh, the other one is the uh, I mean, aquaculture, development of uh, shrimp aquaculture is another uh, important reason for the undermining of uh, the marine uh, resources, marine fisheries. Uh, large quantities of uh, uh, fish feed is used for the production of the fish feed, I mean shrimp feed, as you could see the picture, which is used for uh, the aqua shrimp aquaculture, and then the pollution into the other land-based activities. And also these uh, shrimp farmers use a lot of antibiotics to kill the virus. And uh, those antibiotics are also getting into open the water bodies. Who knows the present uh, virus crisis could be one of the, one of these, one of the factors. Then uh, climate change. Uh, my point is I'm not getting into the, uh, the projected uh, change in the climate change, but only the point that I want to mention at this stage is Okay, you have climate change is uh, becoming a, a very important factor, but absolutely no coverage of risk factors faced by the coastal communities. There is a lot of vulnerability, there is a social stability is uh, questioned, sustainability, but insurance is not there for the people. You could see the coastal erosion in uh, many parts of the coastal uh, areas of uh, Karnataka, but again, when the erosion happens, 
people leave lose, lose their uh, habitat lose their houses lose their uh, land everything but then uh, there is no insurance so people have to go and beg the politicians some people may end up in getting the subs i mean getting some compensation some people may not get any compensation so the other one is the tourism which i mentioned in the beginning uh, in all the in the entire country eight beaches of five states and two union territories were awarded the blue flag certification by an international jury comprising of eminent members from the UNEP, WTO, IUCN and other countries, other uh, uh, international organizations. These blue flag beaches, how in the form of in huge investment, you know, it in each blue flag beach, around 12 to 15 crores of rupees has been invested. With the result, the local ecology is being affected and the area required for fish processing, fish drying by the women is lost. Okay, so the, uh, as far as the Padubitri, Padubitri is one of the, uh, I mean, blue flag beach. Before it became a blue flag beach, which I showed in the previous slide, the, the to total area was like that. I mean, I you could see the red uh, uh, point where the present uh, uh, blue flag beach exists around two and a half kilometers, and uh, the white sandy beaches are no longer there. The mangrove forests are no longer there. Everything has been completely uh, destroyed. Now, grabbing of coastal wetlands by the state. This is another important uh, factor undermining, I mean, which is response, I mean, which is, uh, I wouldn't say this is exclusively because of uh, marine fisheries subsidies, but the subsidy subsidized the state investment, unsustainable state investment in the coastal wetlands. See, you could see that in 93, I will not get into the, uh, all the uh, 93, 94, 93, 95, the price of value of one acre of coastal wetland was only 2.62 lakhs. Now, in 2016-17, when the oil refinery expansion was taken place, they offered, the government offered 60 lakhs per acre. In addition to, the company has offered another 20 lakhs as excretia bonus. That means, per acre, 80 lakhs of rupees per um, in coastal wetlands within the um, in the coastal area, which is being used for either coastal agriculture or coastal fisheries, like that. So that that land has been uh, the, the land value has been increasing, and the government is forcibly acquiring by using the Industrial Areas Development Act. So I mean, this is the chronologically I have shown you how the entire coastal wetlands in the Dakshina Kannada district has been acquired by the, um, so totally around 11,662 acres of land in Mangalore Taluk alone. And some of these areas are becoming urban wards. See, how can you allow a hazardous, um, very risky oil refinery companies along with the wards? But then that is what is happening in, in Mangalore. So this is the type of uh, destruction that has happened along the coast. Uh, mangroves have been lost from 152 hectares in 2014. Uh, it is 114, 2014 and 2004, it was 175, around 30, um, around 30 hectares of uh, mangroves in one in small area has been lost. So uh, industry, innovation and infrastructure, government has identified about 550 projects worth of rupees 8 lakh crores to be implemented on the the Sagarmala projects, 14 coastal economic zones, coastal and port connectivity roads stretching 2,000 kilometers under Bharatmala project. But then if you go and visit any port in, uh, in Karnataka, there is lack of supply of portable uh, water for drinking, fresh water for hand washing, and cleaning of auction halls and uh, uh, effluent treatment plants and drainages. So, but we are planning for new and new ports, new and new expansion and all that. And then uh, overfishing, illegal, unreported and unregulated uh, uh, fishing is another important uh, uh, factor. Maybe Rashid and uh, they, will, uh, they will be covering more on these things. I will, I will skip because of uh, the time, time availability. So what are the impacts? Indiscriminate uh, biomass fishing, converting bycatch into target catch is highly unsustainable in the medium and long term. Socially, in terms of equity and social justice, which I showed you, showed you 
viability of small scale fishers and local fish traders who are largely out competed by both trawlers and also by the fish meal agents food security the dry fish production has completely come down the industry essentially converts relatively cheap small fish that would have been affordable to poor people into higher priced shrimp fish and shrimp mainly for rich consumers in the export market so then finally I, uh, this is my last slide circular economy and uh, marine carrying capacity in uh, many developing countries globalization imposes demands on already stressed resources in order to support if you look at the uh, national center for uh, coastal research it's based in chennai they will show that most of the water quality index in most of the coastal states in coastal near the ports has completely deteriorated it is not um, it is it doesn't meet the threshold level of aquatic water quality index countries that are high in dependent upon the trade in potentially more risk of, so basically we will be exporting more and more water more and more uh, uh, biodiversity in the form of promoting more and more international trade and also more and more pollution of the coastal waters so during 15 2015 as i mentioned 62% of the untreated sewage and 390 million tons of industrial effluents was released into the aquatic system according to the uh, central water commission 70% of the total sea transport is ferried through the indian coastal waters and oil pollution happens to be one of the major uh, uh, major uh, causes of uh, pollution so uh, i end with, uh, with I, i hope i have not taken uh, more time uh, and i, I if i mean i'm open for question and answers thank you thank you very much dr bhatta as always enlightening and also very depressing uh, <laughs> uh, there must be some good news out there but uh, at clearly from your presentation is getting worse and worse for fishermen um, and and increasingly to me it's looking like a justice issue more than anything else uh, we will uh, have a discussion around it there are a lot of q and a's coming up uh three already but uh, let's not waste more uh, you know let's just move on to the next speaker dr sunil mohammed uh and hope he has some better news for us <laughs> mr mohammed over to you thank you yeah uh thank you shailendra and the earth journalist network uh for giving me this opportunity to speak with you uh uh actually uh, i know dr butta probably had a, a quite depressing things to say but uh many things are like that but uh, but there is hope i think uh, definitely uh there is hope i hope you are able to see my uh, slide yes yes we can can yeah can you just expand it that's it you can see it better now yes thank you okay so once again thanks to the earth journalism network uh, for giving me this opportunity i will be uh, of course all the uh, drawbacks of not having a good system in place in india uh, has been shown by professor butta i'll try to see how what are the positive things and how we are moving towards sustainability in india's marine fisheries as i think all of you know seafood is one of the most globally traded community uh, commodity it's much more than coffee uh, cocoa or sugar and also the role of uh, uh, fish trade in developing countries is uh, was 30 per, uh, 39% in 1976 is nearly 60% in 2016 so uh, that's an improvement uh, the per capita consumption uh, global consumption It's also gone up from 10 kilogram in 1960 to 22 kilogram in 2018, and uh, seafood makes about uh, 17% of the global uh, protein uh, population's protein intake. So, again, um, a good thing, uh, good nutritious food there. Uh, and of course, because we are harvesting a natural resource, the sustainability issue is a major thing. and sustainable development uh, as a concept started in 1992 and there was overwhelming support from all parts of the world for 
uh, this particular concept. And uh, currently, uh, it's defined as um, that something that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. There are so many definitions for this. Uh, I just took one of them. So uh, in a sense, uh, it is something very essential for our uh, future. And there are certain dimensions to sustainability, like it being equitable, social, bearable, you have to take care of the environment, uh, the economic aspects, you know, and all, put all these two things together and a viable alternative is the sustainable alternative. And uh, the FAO has uh, uh, been addressing this. And in 2019, November, uh, they held a very uh, strong, I um, mean, very internationally uh, well uh, uh, attended meeting on uh, fisheries sustainability. And its focus was on science policy nexus. So uh, also we know about the sustainable development goals and uh, also the fact that number 14 of these SDG goals is life below water, a major concern. But uh, fisheries also uh, straddle over many other goals, like uh, what I was talking about, poverty, uh, so many other things, livelihoods, uh, inequality, so many things. But life below water is a major concern for uh, fisheries. And this is an important slide, again, by FAO. Uh, it shows you the uh, percentage of overfished and uh, sustainable stocks and also underfished. So as you can see from 1974 to uh, almost 2017, the percentage of underfished stocks is decreasing. Therefore, uh, uh, there's very little underfished stock left, which means um, mankind is exploiting almost all that is there in our oceans. And, but more than 60% of what is being exploited is sustainably exploited. And there are, of course, a number of unsustainable stocks too. And uh, the, propor uh, the proportion of both the sustainable and unsustainable seems to be increasing at the cost of the underfished. Okay. Uh, but this is an important uh, message uh, in the light of many other depressing uh, documentaries that like the sea piracy, which has come about very recently. So it's important to remember this, that um, the sustainably fish stocks are actually improving and uh, uh, actually science and management has a big role to play in this. And coming to India, uh, I think uh, this is a, uh, I think many people would have already seen this. Uh, what is the coastline? What is our economic zone? About 2 million square kilometers. I'm not going to read through it because anyway, you're going to get it, but we do have considerable physical at assets. And we have a fisherman population of nearly 4 million people out of which nearly 1 million are active fishermen. We have more than uh, 1,200 fish landing centers all along our uh, nearly 8,000 kilometers of coast. And we have uh, nearly 200,000 fishing vessels, uh, which is again a big number. So uh, we'll see how, uh, and again, if you look at the value, it's about 11.5 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, export is about 6 billion, but uh, right now only 45% is coming from marine capture. Uh, uh, aquaculture has overtaken uh, capture fisheries quite long ago in India. Uh, nearly 1 million tons is exported. It forms about 3% of the exports and domestic markets are the main markets and mostly fresh marketed. Very little is frozen, about 6% dry and 5% fish meal. And per capita fish consumption is very variable. And uh, there are many statistics on this, uh, but roughly three kilogram per person per year is uh, maybe the average. Uh, but the range is very big from 39, for example, in Lakshadweep, or about 29 in Kerala and West Bengal to about 0.3 in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, so the hinterland of India uh, does not eat much, much fish. Its share in GDP is about 1%, share in agriculture GDP is about 5.5%. And this is again a graph which shows 
right, right from 1950s, where India's production of, from marine sector was about half a million tons, it's nearly come up to 4 million tons. Uh, it's been ups and downs, but uh, there have been uh, uh, phases where the growth has been very good. And if you look at the growth rate uh, and you compare it with the global scene, the blue line is India, and you can see a positive growth, about 2%. But in the uh, world global fish catch, it's actually an uh, almost negative growth. And India has certain advantages because the resources that we have uh, are in the tropics. Uh, most of the fishes have high fecundity, they have continuous spawning, faster growth rates, they have an abundant spawning stock, which means uh, the number of fish with eggs is uh, considerably higher than, uh, uh, than normal. And there's a quick turnover of generations, uh, that is, uh, the next generation is out within about a year or two. So uh, all these are positive things for India. Plus, we have a, uh, uh, this just in 2018, what's the major, uh, 10 major catches uh, of uh, sources. Uh, you can see that the Indian oil sardine uh, in this uh, pie chart is only about 4.5%. But about three, four years ago, uh, or maybe five, six years ago, this would have been about 25%. So sardines have uh, uh, experienced a a steep decline in their abundance. But uh, there are other resources like uh, mackerel, cephalopods, penate prawns, uh, bream, which make up the major proportion of these resources. And also, uh, what makes uh, tropical fisheries very complex is uh, the large number of crafts and also the types of uh, exploitation, the gear combinations, craft gear combinations, are more than 30, which makes actually management very, very difficult. So the major crafts are either mechanized, motorized, or non-motorized. The non-motorized sector is now very small. Ma major sector is the mechanized. And you can see some of the major gears, like the troll, gill net, bag net seams, and hooks and lines. So the non-mechanized sector is now, now but just about 1%. The motorized sector is 17, and about 80% is mechanized. And trawl, about 54% forms the major gear contributor to this uh, production. And another advantage that we have, or, or probably disadvantage, is a high species diversity in the catch. This is a comparison between 2017 and 18. And you can see the Tamil Nadu state has the maximum number of species in the catch. In 2018, it was 564 species. Uh, uh, an improvement from 488 in 2017. Uh, so uh, as you go up uh, from the uh, uh, equator, as you go up uh, the latitudes, northern latitudes, the species diversity actually decreases, but also it depends on the length of the coastline and the intensity of exploitation. Uh, and also our species have diverse biological characteristics. They are either fast growing or slow growing. Uh, they can be very lengthy or very flattened. Uh, all these things make a big difference in sustainability because uh, whereas an eel can probably escape from a net fairly easily, a, a flat uh, uh, fish like the angelfish cannot, ex cannot escape so, or a comfort cannot escape so easily. And also the life patterns are so diverse. We have egg bearers, we have uh, uh, then uh, schooling fishes, migratory fishes, sex transformation, animals which die after spawning. So there's so many different types of uh, life history patterns in our resources. And all these things make uh, tropical fisheries a very complex, uh, plus the number of gears exploiting the crafts, the number of people. Uh, so uh, many of the science that is developed in the temperate countries are probably not applicable to us. And that's why sometimes we fail in our management. But even so, uh, because of certain inherent uh, advantages that we have, for example, high fecundity, high growth rate, uh, some of our resources, all, although they are heavily exploited, they seem to survive this exploitation. Uh, very recently, we have looked at uh, resilience and vulnerability of uh, Indian India's marine fishes, uh, like Telios. Telios means uh, bony fishes. Elasmobranchs are sharks. 
crustaceans are the light blue color and mollusks are the uh, purples. So on this, uh, uh, on the x-axis, you have resilience, which is in the reverse order. Number three, yeah, three to one, and three is highly resilient. And uh, on the y-axis, you have vulnerability, uh, which is uh, again in the regular order, one to three again. And uh, one is very uh, less, I mean, very vulnerable, less vulnerable, and three is very vulnerable. So you, if you see the distribution of these fishes, you can see that um, uh, many of the elasmobranchs, like this brown uh, points, are uh, low in resilience and very high, highly vulnerable. Uh, and as you know, sharks and other species like uh, allied to them are having very uh, long lifespans, very low fecundity. Uh, and their exploitation, they are a target species and so the exploitation is pretty high. India is uh, one among the largest shark fishing, fishing nations in the world. So, uh, but on the other hand, end of the spectrum, you have the light blues, that is the crustaceans. They are uh, low in vulnerability and high, reasonably high in resilience. But you can see that most of these species are lying in the middle, which means they have, say, a medium resilience and medium vulnerability. So just being in the tropics with all the inherent characters of high fecundity and uh, fast growth does not make our species, or all our species very resilient. Some of them are indeed very vulnerable and uh, uh, actually we need to be very, very careful. Otherwise, uh, as Dr. Butta said before, we are uh, facing many, many issues with regard to uh, decreasing catches and increasing incomes to fishermen. So uh, it's important also because you're a group of journalists, I thought some of these slides are important. What is a fishery? When uh, it involves people, species, the type of fish, the area of water, seabed, method of fishing, class of boats. So, uh, and why does it need conservation and management? Uh, first, in the first place, it's a national wealth, uh, depending on uh, uh, which part of the sea it is available. And also it's unseen, so it's not very easy to estimate what we have. And so very easily we can overexploit if you do not know what exactly we have in the sea. And to whom does it belong to? It belongs to the entire country, the people of the country, and the government is a trustee managing these resources. Uh, so uh, it's important to know this and in fisheries management is the activity of protecting these resources so that sustainable exploitation is possible. And very often we use another term called as precautionary principle. That is, even if you do not know, you do not have full information of any uh, resource or fisheries uh, so that management can happen, you have to ha take a, a, a cautionary uh, approach. There's just like the frogs in the boiling pot. So one says the burden of proof and the other says, it, yeah, I think we need to, we need not to have the proof, we need to get out of this boiling water. So uh, fisheries management is indeed uh, uh, very tough to do, very tough to practice actually. And uh, one of the ways in which uh, we assess fisheries is, is by looking at the yield curve, you can see the curve on the left corner here. So with increasing effort, the catch increases until a point at which it decreases. And then these are the costs. And so there is an optimum, and this is usually called as the maximum sustainable yield. And the bio uh, on this plot, you can see the biomass at the maximum sustainable yield and the current biomass, and this is a ratio. And if it is at one, it's good. And if it's above one, it's very good. And, a, and this F is the fishing effort or fishing mortality, how much is effort you put in. So the, uh, so the red part is when the stocks come into the red part, it's unsustainable. In the green part, it's sustainable. Here, you need to be careful. And in this quarter, you have to, actually the stock is rebuilding. That is the biomass is low, below one, but the effort, fishing effort is also low. 
So uh, this is when the stock is rebuilding. So this is an important, to, important for people to know how fishery scientists uh, manage to assess the stocks. And why should we do this sustainable fisheries? And these are some examples that uh, if the global fish harvest could be 40, it could be 40% or higher if it's all sustainably managed, which means it could earn another $50 billion. And there are so many examples where people, scientists have worked out uh, uh, scenarios where sustainable fisheries would lead to better incomes for fishermen and better uh, health of the seas and the resources. Uh, so how are we doing in fisheries management? This is again a global study of many countries uh, by the University of Washington, uh, Melanie Shook et al, 2016. And uh, you can see that many of the developing, this is a mean response and uh, some of the areas in which the response was taken by research, management, enforcement of laws, socioeconomic status and stock status. And you can see that many of the developed countries like US, Iceland, Norway, uh, Canada are all uh, having high scores for all, all these uh, five parameters. Whereas India does have a remarkably a very high score for research and stock status reasonably good score, but does fail in uh, enforcement management and socioeconomics. So uh, uh, the only consolation is that Many other countries are below us, uh, maybe Philippines, Bangladesh, China. But it's not uh, going to be last for long because this is an assessment made in 2015. And in my guess, we have probably slipped down uh, even from this position. Uh, uh, very recently, we have looked at uh, Indian fish stocks, 223 fish stocks all over India uh, using the uh, Kobe plot, the plot that I showed you earlier. And you can see that the proportion of fish stocks, uh, these dots are stocks uh, are, uh, in the sustainable category is about 34%. In the overfished is much more 36%. Recovering is 26% and overfishing is just about three, four percent. So uh, you can see that uh, the majority of stocks are in the overfished category. And, but fortunately for us, there's a good proportion in the recovering ca uh, category, that is this yellow. So uh, many stocks are recovering, even though our management is not uh, very high class or very, I mean, enforcement is not very good. Even so, uh, because of the inherent biological characters of these resources, many of the stocks are recovering. And again, this is a chart which shows the ratios of the MSY or the maximum sustainable yield to catch biomass and effort. And if you can look at the catch uh, uh, by catch MSY, you can see uh, it, it, it is rising, but it, the proportion is low. But most importantly, the biomass was increasing, but not, did not cross one and now has uh, slipped to eight. Uh, 0 0.7, uh, and whereas the fishing effort, which was down uh, or sort of steady, has started increasing. So the fishermen have started uh, putting more pressure on the stocks, and the stocks have responded by uh, uh, by depletions in their populations of biomass. So this is not not at all a healthy situation, and we need to tackle this and. Uh, we have uh, actually this paper further goes on to say how uh, we we need to, in which sectors we need to reduce effort so that uh, the uh, status of the stocks can be improved. And uh, I think many of you know this governance in India. We are both in the union and the state list. The union list uh, has the majority of the area, about 92% of the area. Uh, and the state list is mostly open access and mostly small scale fisheries. Uh, so, uh, but uh, there are a number of laws and uh, agencies managing this area, uh, assuming that this is the coastal zone. We have a number of laws. Um, in, uh, the major fisheries law is the Territorial Marine Fisheries Reg Regulation Acts of the Maritime States. 
But uh, the area between 12 to 200 does not have a regular fisheries law. It has long, it's been long in the making, but uh, the parliament has somehow never managed to pass this, even 75 years after independence. Uh, we have other laws, uh, Environmental Protection Act, Indian Wildlife Protection Act, Biological Diversity Act, many laws, but uh, uh, enforcement is actually quite poor. Uh, so, and, and also these uh, is also known as what is called as legal pluralism, actually confounds the uh, already complex system. And therefore, many of the people get away by not obeying laws because of this pluralism. In any case, we have we do have fisheries input controls and output controls. Uh, we have vessel registrations, closed fishing seasons, closed fishing areas, uh, gear specifications, control over destructive fishing practices. In output controls, we have minimum legal sizes very recently, and also certain uh, protected species under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. Very recently, I think Dr. Butter was also referring to this. Uh, the the enormous um, uh, attention that is being paid to increasing production from aquaculture, especially shrimp, has led to uh, what is known as a fishing for catastrophe, where a lot of uh, young fish and juvenile fish are fished targetly, uh, and they are targeted and fished so that they uh, get into the fish meal and fish oil uh, plants, and which feed the uh, shrimp, which we don't eat, which we export to the rich countries. So uh, are we destroying our fish wealth in order to feed uh, the rich people in other countries? This is an open question. So this needs um, a larger debate on this, but we have not uh, really sat on our haunches uh, considering this. We have gone into trying to regulate this, uh, especially in Kerala, where concern about uh, fishing, young fish and juvenile fish is especially of, of Kerala's favorite oil sardine. Uh, so uh, so the, the minimum legal size came into existence about, uh, I think, in 2015 or 16. And uh, so it uh, aims to control uh, the uh, fish, I mean, the, the size of the fish that can be caught. So uh, the, it has been recommended for, uh, I mean, Kerala has made the change in rule and strict enforcement is in place. Actually, government of Kerala collects more than two, two and a half crores annually from fines. Karnataka has recently made the rule change, but not enforced. Tamil Nadu is sitting on recommendation, so is Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra. So, uh, but actually this law is very difficult to enforce, uh, considering uh, our uh, uh, species, uh, the small uh, smallness of uh, many of the species and all that. But even so, uh, it builds an awareness among fishers about the uh, uh, about it as a bad practice. And we also have tremendous overcapacity. The CCR of uh, Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries actually says states should prevent overfishing capacity, should implement management measures uh, uh, to ensure that fishing effort is commensurate with the pr productive capacity of the resources and their sustainable utilization. So you can see a picture of how many Chinese uh, dip nets in a small part of the Bermudaan Lake in near Kochi. So CMFRA has been making uh, study this issue on overcapacity and the recent stock assessment of over 200 fish stocks actually showed how much is overcapacity is there in many states and also to what, how, how we can reduce this overcapacity, uh, evidently troll Multi MDTN stands for multi-day troll, MTN for mechanized troll, dole net is a kind of a bag net which is operated in Maharashtra. OBRS is outboard ring scene, HNL is hooks and lines, and GN is gill net. And you can see that uh, the purple color of troll uh, uh, has the maximum uh, overcapacity. The reductions are sometimes as high as 62% in Karnataka and Pondicherry, uh, anyway, above 40% in many states. Uh, there are also other gears which are having overcapacity, but it's troll, which is the major gear having overcapacity, and we need to reduce this. The, uh, how to do it is something that the management, the states and the center has to decide. 
uh, one of the things that Kerala has done on regulation of fishing effort in order to reduce overcapacity, it has made a moratorium on new fishing craft for next 10 years. It has uh, brought in a registration for boat building yards and boat building yards can build new boats, vessels only after getting permission from the government and only replacement is allowed. So uh, the, uh, already there are moves towards sustainability here. And also we, I already told you that uh, we have some special regulation where uh, traditional fishermen have uh, certain rights. They have uh, certain exclusive access areas very close to the shore. Uh, also, we, Kerala government again has introduced co-management, which is uh, recognizes fishermen participation in the management system. And uh, the Kerala government has gone in for a three-tiered uh, system where there's a village council, district council, and state council. And actually, CMFR has recommended this to the state for the entire country with the National Marine Fisheries Management Council, uh, regional councils, and state councils. Uh, so. Unfortunately, the, uh, the uh, government seems to be sitting on this. Uh, we also earmarked uh, as a kind of a zonal management system where uh, rather than having the entire EZ as one zone, we are split it up into ecosystem-based zonal management. Many countries are actu actually already doing this. Uh, many of the developed and developing countries, even Indonesia and Malaysia, already have a zonal management system in place. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, and we have uh, actually proposed uh, combining the zonal management and the participatory management uh, together to form uh, many councils, about 13 state councils and seven regional councils. Another move towards uh, sustainability is the use of eco labels. I think many of you are aware of this. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it is a, a market-based re regulatory mechanism where the uh, consumers decide on whether uh, on their purchase based on sustainability. So a consumer decides to purchase only fish if it is caught sustainably. So there are several labels, uh, for example, in aquaculture, the best aquaculture practice, there's the ASC or the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. One of the most famous in the marine fishery sector is the certify, uh, MSC or the Marine Stewardship Council, Dolphin Safe or the Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium uh, label. So echo labels are a, a market-based system and uh, I will not go into this. Um, so, and it's uh, actually making a, a, a bit of a difference in all over the world. So as you can see from the volume of MSC certified catch, you can see that there are 100 and uh, there about, um, about 15 or 50, more than 15% of the global 80 million catch is now certified fisheries, 11.8 million. About 138 fisheries are in assessment. Yeah, about 15% of the global catch and 41 countries with certified fisheries. So this global movement is catching on. There are many labels now and of course MSC is one of the leading labels. And uh, we also looked at whether Indian fisheries need certification. We thought about it from 2010 onwards. The CMFR and WWF have been working together on this. And in 2014, we got the short neck clam fisheries of Ashtamudi Lake as India's first MSC certified fisheries. Uh, and, uh, uh, and further to that, we now have more than 12 fisheries which are moving towards um, certifi MSC certification after the Ashtamudi clam. So you can see it's mostly in Tamil Nadu, Kerala and Lakshadweep. Uh, some of the, uh, the black ones are all troll caught species. Uh, which are actually quite difficult to uh, reach uh, a certificate because of uh, it's a multi-species fisheries uh, targeting a large number of resources. Uh, but we, we are slowly moving towards uh, sustainability. Some of the other ones are um, uh, small scale fisheries, like for example, uh, the whelk uh, fisheries, then, then the blue swimming crab in Tamil Nadu, which is a gillnet, uh, fisheries, uh, then the pollen lion skipjack tuna in Lakshadweep, uh, the trap caught lobster in Tamil Nadu. All these are small scale fisheries, and uh, uh, actually, uh, this is one way by which we can slowly move towards uh, better and sustainable fisheries. I think with this, I come to the end of my talk. 
thank you once again for giving me this opportunity uh, to uh, talk to you and uh, uh, I hope that we can have some fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed. It was, as always, the lightning. And yes, we saw a little bit of hope. And interestingly, the hope is coming from Kerala. <laughs> the Kerala model of fisheries is something else that the whole nation is going to look at. It's very interesting to see that there is, uh, even as we look at annual growth rate uh, in marine fisheries increasing, we uh, that could also be because of improved gear and improved uh, fishing pra practices on one way. Um, and I think this focus on recovering stocks is what uh, should be next, but we are running out of time. So I'm not going to ask you a lot of questions. The chat box, the Q&A box is open. I can see Dr. Bhatta has been responding to all of you uh, as you put your questions in. I'm going to invite Dr. Rashid Sumaila to uh, enlighten us now. He's like in the thick of, uh, I, I would say like right in the middle of the uh, discussions around uh, uh, subsidies at WTO. And he, of course, has a lot to tell us. Rashid, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay. We can't thank hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, you, yes. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, thanks to the uh, every journal, journalism network for inviting me and making it possible for me to be part of this uh, interesting workshop. So, yeah, so it's, it's really nice. I'm lucky because my uh, Dr. Bata and, Bata and Dr. Mohammed have actually touched on aspects of my talk. So hopefully I'll be able to go fast and uh, give in the time. So the title is Subsidies of Fishing and the Sustainable Development Goals. And you have that, the follow up uh, is why ending fishery subsidies matters for India in my view, right? So, and based, based on research essentially. So that is uh, what we are going to do. So and we're talking with journalists here. So I have a few, you will see that almost all my slides have this kind of uh, headline, you know, just to kind of summarize quickly what I'm going to talk about. So, so watch out for them. The first point is that the ocean is simply too large to mess up, you know. It's too large to mess up. Uh, it's 70% of the surface of the and as I like to tell my students, if you mess up 70% of exams, you are in trouble, right? None of us will be in this uh, meeting if we were scoring 30% in our exams, right? So 70% so of anything you care about, you better take good care of it. So that's point number one. Uh, uh, and it's also to follow that is that because the ocean is large, doesn't mean we cannot mess it up. We have the technology, we have the population, we have the demand, we have the income to actually mess up the ocean. And you can, you've already seen evidences of this in the earlier talk. So, so the third thing that goes with this is, because it's so large, it doesn't mean that we cannot do something about it. You get it. So we say, oh, the ocean is too large. What can I do? Yeah, you can do something. Because remember, the whole ocean itself is made up of little drops of water. So little drops of water make a mighty ocean. So each of us individually, collectively, as companies, government workers, as NGOs, together our little efforts can add up to make sure that we don't mess up our ocean, right? So that's, these are the three points I make with this slide. The next one is I'm sharing what I consider my my most favorite model, I really love this model because it boils down everything to the basics. And, and, and I think it talks to journalists as well as other people very, very straightforwardly. Uh, number one, we, 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 we need to really take care of the environment in general and the ocean because we all depend on the environment. We depend on the marine environment, terrestrial systems, we depend on them. Uh, here I'm saying millions of Indians depend on the ocean, depend on the fish. 
many people are employed in the fishery. They, we get our incomes and our food, our nutrition, micronutrients. So this is important. And uh, a key point here is we, we just have to know that with no fish, there will be no fishers, no fisheries, because really fisheries depend on fish being there. And when you have no fisheries, you will have no fish protein, no food security contribution, and no meat to take home, right? So again, this emphasizes the fact that we need to take care of the environment. We need to take care of life in the ocean so they can also take care of us. Not only us, but our children and grandchildren. This is where the future comes in, and as Dr. Mohammed said in the quote about sustainable development. So if you look at what we do, we the people, what we do to, with the environment, we do basically two things. We go to the ocean and we take all the good things, the good stuff, the food, the oil, the energy that we need, we take them into the economy and we do all our cultural, all our economic, our social, all the things human beings do with what we take from nature and then in that we produce waste. And where does the waste go? It goes back to the environment. See the point here? So that's why I love this model. It just boils everything down from the, from the ocean comes good things to the ocean go, go, goes the bad stuff. And if we don't do the taking wisely and we don't minimize and do the, the pumping of waste wisely, we're going to kill this important resource for all of us. Okay. And as we take the fish, for example, into the economy, all the sociology, the cultural, the anthropology, the economies come into play. So, so that the resources we take meets the needs of as many people as possible. You want to feed as many people as possible. The fish we take, not just one small proportion of the population running off with it. So there's the equity part and, and so on, which I will, I will come back to. Now, what are we doing with our relationship with the ocean? Uh, really, when you look at this, and this has been shown before by the earlier speakers in various ways, uh, in general, we don't seem to be doing well. We are overtaking the resources we need. And also we are over polluting, over pumping in general. Of course, there are packets of good, good stuff happening like uh, Dr. Mohamed showed, showed, right? Up here, when you look, this is the famous fishing down marine food web, which was published by Pauli and his group here in 1998 in science, and where they, they, they demonstrated that generally what we do is we take the big fish, the valuable fish first, then we go to the next one, then the next one. And before you know, uh, according to Daniel, you end up with jellyfish or even mud, right? That is why we need management and we need conservation. We need to do these things wisely. Otherwise, we're driving ourselves to hell. Then you have climate change. It has come up. Oil, acid, uh, ocean acidification. You have deoxygenation. Parts of the ocean lacking the minimum oxygen you need for life to thrive in. Then you have the big pollution problem. My God, plastic and debris and oil spills going in and so on. So, so there's a lot that we're doing that needs to be fixed if we're going to maintain a good relationship with nature, with the ocean, so the nature and the ocean can also help us. Why do we care about the ocean? Why do we care about life in the ocean? Actually, it's not just because we love biodiversity. We do, some of us do at different levels, but ultimately declining oceans have serious human consequences. And this is this figure came up earlier. That is these two on top uh, uh, from our group here at UBC. And the bottom one is the one I think was it uh, Sunil? You showed this, right? One of you showed that. And and that's from the FAO. So essentially, the analysis of global fisheries is telling us that increasingly we are taking less and less fish from the health, healthy part of the ocean. You know. Yeah, some are being rebuilt here. That's the green part. Some some countries are really trying. The U.S. is actually good in this one. You are, when the stock is declared over fish, they actually ban fishing. 
and, and try to bring it back in 10 years. So there are countries that are doing that. But a lot of our fish are not in good shape. And that's what you see. And this thing is not just about the fish. This is a guy say, is that all the shrimp I get? All the work I've done, you know? Almost every fishing community I've been to, whether in Africa, in Asia, I've been to some in Latin America, in Canada. People are working longer hours for less and less fish. To me, that is one big indicator of the fact that we are overdoing it, right? In West Africa, they used to go six hours, they fill the boat with healthy big fish. Now they go a week, they don't get the same fish. So there you go, right? And then this lady here, increasingly we are seeing more and more people what are becoming environmental refugees. So if you are in your community and there's no fish, there's no food, People don't just sit down and die. We move. This is how immigration has happened throughout human history. Has nothing to do with Mexicans or only Africans or Asians or Europeans. Everybody has moved when things are tough. So forced migration is increasing. If we don't take care of nature, we're going to really have it hard. And it's not only these people moving who, 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 who are messed up. But even those of us in countries where it's livable, you see the Europeans, West Africans banging on their doors and they're unhappy and so on. So there are huge human consequences. Now, how do you fix this? Economists have solution all, all the time, right? So these are pure, mainly economic solutions, but I think most of fisheries science and management agrees here. Key thing you need to do is to remove the incentive to overfish, okay? And there are many ways you do this. You improve national fisheries management, Indian fisheries management. There is a lot to be improved everywhere, including Canada. So we all always have to try to improve management, understand the, the, the system, get the research that do monitoring, control, and surveillance, and all the management function. Push for regional cooperative management because really. A lot of species don't live all their life in, in EEZs of <laughs> one country. They move. They don't respect the lines we put on the water. Uh, I like to joke that Mexican fish, American fish, they, they don't need visa. They just go, right? And Brexit, the fish don't care about Brexit. So, so you need to have regional management to manage our shared stocks. IUU fishing was mentioned earlier, illegal fishing, make it unprofitable and economics can help here. Buy insurance because no matter how much we know about natural systems, there is still something we don't know. That's why some of us economists like the idea of marine protected areas and marine reserves. Protect part of your portfolio so that even if you make a mistake and mess up where you fish, you have a backup. This is why you don't put all your money in one stock or all your money in, uh, which is the, the, the fast growing Indian stock. I don't know, but, but you, you have to diversify your portfolio. So that's that. Last but not the least, don't give your fishing sector subsidies that lead to overcapacity and overfishing. Because even without that, it's difficult to manage our fisheries. They are common property. We don't understand them fully. It's difficult to manage this. Then you give harmful subsidies. It's like pouring petrol on fire, right? That is what we are doing with our tax money. So the rest of the talk will be about that. I believe most of you know what is fisheries subsidies. Essentially, you can think of it as government or government entities favoring one sector giving one sector advantages, financial advantages, whether directly or indirectly, that benefits the sector in such a way that it either decreases their cost of economic activity or artificially increases the revenue they get. And the effect of either of this or both is to increase the profitability artificially. And anyone in business, in commercial activity, you actually fish for profit, not just the fish. And so if your profit is artificially inflated, you are going to fish more, everything being equal. So that is a simple economic theory of why many of us don't like harmful subsidies. Mind you, I, I keep saying harmful, so not all subsidies are bad. Some are good, like everything, you just have to do it wisely. Otherwise it will harm you. 
So, so why why should India care? Why should any country care? When I was talking in Senegal, I said, why should Senegal care? And, and the, the reasons are, are, are quite the same all over because the subsidies are substantial. You already had 277 million uh, US dollars in India, and that is not the biggest, my dear friends. There are countries giving billions of dollars. So, and in economics, we talk about the opportunity cost of capital. If you spend $270 million doing encouraging overfishing, that's the same money you don't have to take care of people who have COVID, for example, or to get vaccines for people. Uh, you, you spend the money here, you can spend it there. That's the opportunity cost. And that's one reason why economists are, are always worried about spending tax money in this way. Then there are trade impacts. You know, one country gives a lot of subsidies, the other doesn't. That's, you can almost use India. Let's say India and China. China gives much more proportionately than, than India. So they are both can go into the high seas and fish. You don't want that. You want to keep this thing so that all countries and, 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 and countries will compete on the same ground creates all this leads to overcapacity and overfishing, as I said, and it also supports IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. And all of these things, to me, that is the bottom line. All of these things affect and sabotage the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Those 17 goals, giving taxpayer money to go and overfish, is the worst thing, one of the worst things you can do, really. And I, I, will, I will go into this. This is the basic bioeconomic model we used to explain subsidies, which I've done actually verbally. So I'm not going to belabor you with this uh, diagram. The, the first one is if you don't have subsidies, is when you have subsidies. And this is the cost of fishing in a linear form, very simply. And so if somebody's paying your fuel, like we had, like we had, what that does, it, it swings the total cost curve to this part so that the break even point between your revenue and your cost, which is where commercial activity will stop because otherwise you lose money, right? Then because of this, instead of you stopping fishing here, you can push to here because the, the, the losses are being covered by the subsidy. So very simple model that is used to explain you can complicate this. this is a single species static model, but we have dynamic versions and, and, all, and all sorts of things. But it, it just tells you why, why, why uh, overfishing subsidies are not good. So in our group here, we've spent almost 20 years now, 20 years at least actually collecting data globally. There was a time I actually sent a, a student uh, well, it's in, it's her name, she's an uh, Indian, Indian Canadian student. She was going to do field work and, and the Minister of, of Fisheries of India actually allowed her to visit their office uh, when she was there to collect data to help us with this. So we get collaboration from governments because it's important for everybody to know. So this just gives you a very quick picture of our understanding of subsidies in two ways. So here at the top, we use high, high human development income countries uh, and low. And here we use the typical developed developing country uh, division. The difference between these two is that China and Russia, I think Russia, I believe, China in particular is in here because it's a developing country by definition. But if you do the high and low HDI, China then joins this club. And you see that they actually, that's where a lot of the money comes from, 86% from the rich countries and the rest is for the low income countries. And, and similarly here, you know, so again, we give the dimension develop, developing small scale, large scale, as I'll show you. And, and here, this is what we call harmful subsidies, capacity, capacity fueling uh, uh, subsidies. These are the good ones that help you to manage your fisheries well. We like them because it's a, it's a, it's a societal uh, value. And these little ones are those we couldn't classify easily. So total 35 billion point something, total subsidy 22 billion uh, estimated to be harmful. 
and, and these are different types of subsidies. See here, that's fuel subsidies, that's the biggest, followed by fisheries management, which is a good subsidy. This is a bad one, right? Tax exemption of various forms comes next. So these are different subsidies, some of them good, some of them not good, some of them ambiguous for developed and developing countries. Black is the developing and the, uh, the, the, the open one is the developed. So very quickly, the paper is there, is cited if you want to follow, it's, it's public and it's open actually, open access. So you can get to it. So this table is just to give you a, a very nice global comparison very quickly. China gives a lot of subsidies, a total of almost 6 billion, see that? And most of it is, is the bad one, right? Very little good subsidies we can find. And this is data from China, actually. We had, we had a co-author who could read Chinese and read the documents and pull out these numbers. USA is next, but here, if you compare US to China, most of their subsidies are actually good because of the elaborate management system and, and so on and so forth. Korea, Japan, the EU, and India, this is where India is. That's the 277, which was mentioned. I rounded it off here, 278. And that is what, so, so actually India can say, actually, we don't give my subsidies, you know? And, 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 and so to me, this means that India should be a leader at the WTO because what these big countries do affects India, as I will show later, because the ocean doesn't care about borders. The fish go everywhere high seas and so on. So and that just gives you a quick picture. Now, this picture is very important to me because what we did is to take the national totals and say how much of this goes to small scale fishers versus how much of it goes to large scale fisheries, the industry. And this blew my mind, actually, it was amazing. The first estimate we did, we found out only 16% of the total 35 billion goes to small scale fisheries, which actually employs 90% of the people in the fishery and catches half, half of the total global. They get only 16%. The large industrial, about 84%, we've, we've redone this for a more recent year and we are seeing 2080. So, so that's the range you are looking at. And, and, and then when you go in, most of the large industrial fleet subsidies are capacity enhancing bad compared to that, right? And then a, major, a, a good proportion is beneficial for small scale fisheries. So India has many small scale fisheries. So India is somewhere here, and that is what we are getting. And this has consequences, which I will, I will, I will touch on very, very quickly here. And this is what makes me uh, conclude that subsidies are actually sabotaging the sustainable development goals. It favors the large scale. Lots of people work in the small scale in developing countries, the places we want to see development, where we want to see incomes of people increase, where, where there is food needs, malnutrition, and micronutrients. They don't get the money. The large scale get it. They compete in the same market. So the small scale fishers become less viable economically. And, and that is something I don't think the world wants to do because you make the world's problems worse, you know. Then the developing country, developed country, the same thing. I will show you a number a figure later. For every dollar that a developing country fisher gets on average, a developed one gets $7. So I tell Africans, you should be on the roof fighting with the WTO to take away the subsidies because the big countries that have the money are doing it and therefore messing up your competitiveness in the market, right? Men and women, women and men, our data shows that more women proportionately fish small scale are small scale fishers than large scale fishers. So if you do this, you're automatically disadvantages, disadvantages uh, advantaging women. And most of the money is actually to fishing, not in the processing sector where there are more women proportionately. So again, you are aggravating gender inequality, which I don't think any one of us who really wants to be fair, especially the men, if we want to be fair, we want to encourage this because women are disadvantaged almost everywhere, 
everything being equal in the world. We don't want to do that. Then the youth, today and tomorrow, right? Small, young people don't start with the big moon. No, no, they start with small moon and then develop themselves. So, and how about the future generation? So finally, even the environment, because we are overdoing things, we are, we are overfishing. So it's not good for the fish. I, I, I made a joke. I say, if you ask fish, if you ask the fish, if only the fish could talk and you ask the fish, just think of what people are doing. They are giving people subsidies so they will catch you, your babies and your adults too much. The fish will say, oh my God, people are so dumb. People are so stupid. We are willing to feed you too. And you will even do that sustainably? Are you crazy? That's what the fish will say, right? So, so, so it just doesn't make sense. You know? and, and now these are quick figures. In terms of the losses, what we lose, because of ineffective fisheries management, including the giving of subsidies. You see losses, Europe actually overfishing makes them lose close to over 2.5 million tons of fish a year. So if they are fishing effectively, that's what they will get. And here, right, you see, this is Asia, uh, over 2 million and so on and so forth. This is a lot of food, food security, micronutrients and so on. Yeah, so, so, so the big food security consequences. This is the figure I mentioned, right? Disadvantages in men, women, developing countries, youth, and so on. $1 to seven for a developing country fisher versus a developed country on inequality, aggravating it, you don't want to do that. The high seas is another place, right? The ocean, again, doesn't care about the lines we put in there. So, so what you do in the high seas impacts what happens in the coastal waters. So we need to think of management in a more comprehensive way, thinking of the ocean as one. And so a number of us have been talking about how to make sure we manage what happens in the high seas sustainably, because otherwise it will affect, you know, the fish go in and out. Our calculations shows about 78% of the landed value, the revenue we make from fishing comes from fish stocks that go in and out of country waters into the high seas, right? So, so if, you, if they go into the high seas and you overcatch them, less will come into the coastal waters and therefore will affect people who don't go close to the high seas negatively. So this is a, a little illustration in a paper, a series of papers we did. If you have the high seas here and you have country water, say Indian waters and the high seas, it's the fish go in and out. If you manage your high seas well, some of us are saying close a big chunk of, uh, in one paper I said, let's close the high seas to fishing, turn it into a fish bank. So the fish will get there, get peace. And when they get peace, they grow. What happens? They become, if you remove the subsidies, the population there increases and animals just like people, if it is too tight, they actually move in and you catch them cheaply, less costly, you don't pump CO2 and the world is just better. Win, win, win. And actually the fish is also shared more equitably with coastal countries. At the moment, see, five countries take 64% of all the revenues from, 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 from the high seas which is supposed to be owned by all citizens of the world. Close the damn place so that the fish will come into Bangladesh or go into Guinea-Bissau so they can also catch some of these high sea fish in their coastal waters and, and, and we get better distribution. Here is another paper we did where we showed that 54% of the fishing grounds in the high seas will not be profitable if not for subsidies and also slave labor, modern slave labor, where people work for nothing. And that artificially increases the profit of the high sea fleet. And this is also something you don't want. So we are doing quite a bit of research in this area. I'm getting to my last slide here. So we just published a paper, uh, two papers actually, one where we, we said, looking at the absolute number of amount of money you put in, is not the whole story. So China gives 6 billion, but China is also the largest fishing nation. So if you are a small country like Guinea-Bissau, you may give 2 million, but the intensity of that on your stock may actually be high, close to China or more or less, right? So here we calculated subsidy intensities. 
to make sure that the impact on the ecosystem is actually captured. And when you do that, virtually every coastal country needs to take out their harmful subsidies, even if they are small because they have uh, impact. The second paper, which we just published in, oh, I didn't put the, the journal, so I put this so you can follow it up. It's a, in ecological economics. It just came out where we look at how subsidies actually encourage the pumping of carbon into the ocean, messing up, contributing to climate change and affecting the ocean and therefore the fishery and the food we get. You know, All these connections are showing up in the literature. The last one is ongoing work where we are going to try to trace the subsidies that countries give. So if you take, uh, say, say Canada, let's say we take Canada, let's say Canada gives X million dollars a year. We ask the question, where does the harmfulness impact? If Canada is a distant water fishing nation, its fleet go, goes to Latin America and fish there, the subsidies impact is actually in that, those countries' waters, not in not wholly in the country giving the subsidy. So we track that so countries will see that what they do really affects not only them, but other countries. This is exciting work, actually. Looking forward to getting it through the publication process. Finally, finally, I think what we need to do in order to get harmony that the blue economy for it to work sustainably, we need to really think hard when we take actions and design policies like subsidies such that they lead to positive feedback from people to nature and nature to people, rather than currently where it's negative feedback from people to nature. You give subsidies that lead to overfishing. There's less fish, people get more hungry, they go for the last fish, negative feedback. But you can use your subsidies, for example, there's some idea that you, you pay fishers to go catch plastic rather than fish. They clean up the ocean of plastic, they get their income, the fish get a break, so they, are, they get more, become more later, they can feed us more, you clean the ocean, win, win, win. So that's the kind of thinking we need to bring to, to play here in order to protect our oceans with our own tax money. Now, finally, finally, India matters. And I think India has its influential, it's a big country, you cannot mess around with uh, India. It's not like Togo, right? Togo is 48 kilometers, it's a small country. So they can be knocked around, you can do that to India. India is big, important, influential. And, and so you can do a lot. And, and in general, when I look at the literature, Indians talk about poverty more than I guess, I, and there's no scientific backing to this. But I think Indian scholars have been at the forefront of fighting for reduction of poverty, talking for poor people, not only in India, in the developing world. And I think that gives you a lot of power, influence that I hope you can use it at the WTO to help the world solve this problem, really. India can seize the moral high ground on harmful subsidies, I believe, at the WTO for the sake of millions of Indians struggling coastal communities and also communities around the world, actually. And we need to be more innovative in our use of public funds. We need to do creative things. I was in Mexico giving a, an economics lecture and they took me to the management system. What they do during long vacations, they hire local school children who have come back on holiday to go collect data, analyze data with the Department of Fisheries, wonderful. They get money into the families. And at the same time, they give these children possibilities to choose something else other than fishing, because if you can play with data, you are set for something else, right? So that's the kind of thing. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks to the journalists who have put together this and uh, hopefully you've got a few things that can help with your stories. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Rashid. Uh, you reminded me of a slogan from a long time ago, empty seas, empty future. Exactly. And uh, I, I think we are looking at that. Uh, also, I think it's criminal that only five countries are taking away 67% of our global stock, and, uh, which is where I totally hear you when you say countries like India should step up and make their uh, voices heard. Uh, we have already gone 
12 minutes uh, over mm. time, but I see most of the participants. In fact, all the participants are still here. Many of the questions have already been answered. There are still some open questions uh, um, that I can see. One is from Monica um, uh, directly to Dr. Bhatta. Um, and I think uh, uh, if Dr. Bhatta cannot uh, answer it right now because of uh, time constraints, Monica, if you can hear me, can you take this offline to his email address? if it's all right. Um, otherwise we can, I don't know, uh, these are long, uh, very important questions uh, um, and also long, very long questions. So we really don't have time for that right now. Uh, I will have to stop here. Uh, I see something in the chat box. I will just have to remind uh, um, everybody that there is a story grant uh, from Earth Journalism Network. All of you are welcome to apply for the same. Um, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Sumela, and Dr. Bhatta uh, will guide us uh, um, in future as well, uh, uh, both for reporting your stories and any more information you need. Somebody's already been kind enough to actually share their email addresses. So you, I'm sure uh, they don't mind you getting in touch with them directly. Once again, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, it was informative, it was enlightening. I did say it was depressing, but there is always hope uh, out there and let's um, hope for the best. Everybody, please stay safe, uh, take care and all the best. Thank you again. Thank you so yeah. much. Wonderful, bye-bye. Yeah. Talk again soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you and uh, wish you a good day today. Bye. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Huh. Do you have an adapter for the uh, the flat prong thing? Yeah.